aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies, featuring the Large and Small Magellanic Galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum Galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please! Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as Terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula! It's off to the port side, that's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. Get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up, we're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long-exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a Large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a Small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. 
If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas. Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc, or minutes of arc, or seconds of arc, down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of Arc? That's how you measure distances in France. <laughs> Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol. And that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion, resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, Speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not-too-distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light-years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. 
He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space as has Edward Emerson Bernard. Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now, our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour. Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. Dozens of spacecraft and hundreds of probes take off from Earth and head for our planet's twin sister, Venus. It's about the same size as the Earth and has around 80% of our planet's mass. The temperatures here are too high for humans, and it doesn't have the air we're used to breathing. But we went there because scientists recently found traces of phosphine gas, which suggests that life might be there. Phosphine comes from various microbes and bacteria, so humanity goes on this journey to discover this life. With our technology, a flight to Venus would take three and a half to six and a half months, but we finally made it. Spaceships are landing on the planet, and when the first humans come to the surface, they see heat-scorched deserts, lava lakes, and geysers of poisonous acid. And that's it. Scientists miscalculated the radio telescope data. Phosphine never existed on Venus. So we're going back to the rockets, and we're getting ready for a longer trip across our galaxy. The scientists believe that there's at least 36 civilizations in the Milky Way that are similar to ours. They could be living organisms completely different from us. They may have different bodies, different eyes. They may walk and talk in a very different way than we do. But an advanced civilization has several criteria, technological progress, and the use of developed communication between individuals. So these civilizations must explore space, build cities, and be able to communicate with each other as independent species. Let's look at our galaxy and find these civilized worlds. So, the Milky Way is a spiral of 100,000 light years from side to side. If a star is born at one end of it in a super powerful blast, the light from that event won't even reach the other end until 100,000 years later. There's about 100 billion stars, and near each of them, there may be worlds similar to our solar system. Let's try to find these habitable worlds using giant seas. First, we look for stars that have a lot of iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature for the development of life, and the iron in the star system will help form the cores of planets that will be home to another civilization. We sift the Milky Way through our sieve. We see that there are too many stars that fit the description, so we need another filter. Now let's find stars that look like the sun in this pile. The star must be about 100 times larger than the Earth and 333,000 times heavier. An important criterion is the age of the star. When a star gets old, it begins to expand and turns into a red giant. At this time, it can absorb the planets around it, 
The life of such a star can end with a huge blast that destroys everything around it. So the star we're looking for must be relatively young. Let's use our sieve again. There's fewer stars, but still that's a lot. Now let's focus on the planets. They should be in the habitable zone of the star. Not too close to a star because then the temperature would be too high for life to be born. And not too far away. Then the planet would just be an ice block with nothing living on it. The temperature of the planet must allow the water to remain liquid. Another filter is the age of the candidate planet. It takes time for an advanced civilization to develop. Based on the experience of Earth, scientists believe that it takes at least 4.5 billion years for any life form to evolve to the human level. So we're looking for planets similar to Earth or older. We use our sieve one last time, and voila! We have 36 worlds where an advanced civilization is possible. Scientists conducted this study and published it in April 2020, based on these very criteria. All that's left is to discover these civilizations and make the first contact. We can detect such a civilization by using radio waves that come from it. Suppose there's a planet A, with primitive living organisms on it. Millions of years of evolution, and they'll become a civilization with advanced technology. Radio waves will be the way they communicate. Then the whole planet will emit radio waves like a star emits light. And here on Earth, we'll be able to pick up this signal with antennas pointed into space. But there's a problem with the distance between the planets. For example, planet A is 1,000 light years away from the Earth. When planet A starts emitting radio waves, these signals won't reach us until 10 centuries later. We learned to emit and receive radio waves in 1895. And if the civilization on planet A emitted a radio signal at the same time, we won't be able to pick up that signal until 2895. It'll be the same on planet A. We sent a message in the form of a radio signal into space in 1974. In this signal, we encoded our number system, human DNA, and information about our solar system. If there's an advanced civilization on planet A, they'll be able to receive this signal only in 2974 and we'd have to wait another millennium to get a response from them. Another problem with radio waves is that they don't look like a constant glow on the planet, but like a flare. Radio waves are only used at a certain stage of civilization. At first, it's the primary method of communication, but then we begin to use cell phones, cable TV, and fiber optics. And as technology advances further, our radio wave light begins to fade out. So we only have about 100 years of active radio use by civilization to find it. One day, we caught a strange radio signal of an unknown origin. Its characteristics suggested that the signal was created artificially, perhaps by an outer space civilization or a passing starship. Further searches for this signal given no results, and this gave rise to many theories and arguments as to what it really was. It could have been a signal from Earth that reflected off a satellite flying through the sky, or it could have been the traces of a comet a few light years away. But let's assume it was a civilization from outer space, one of those 36 that probably exist. Now we need to make contact with them. So we throw our luggage into a rocket and head out in the direction of our suspected planet. Our rockets can fly at 17,600 miles per hour. That means a rocket could cross the entire United States in just eight minutes. But even if an advanced civilization lived near our closest star, Proxima Centauri, it would take us about 73,000 years to get there. Even at the speed of light, it would take 4.2 years. So we need to solve the problem of space travel. Our scientists plan to reach about a quarter of the speed of light with a laser. A powerful laser beam from Earth will push a microscopic probe in the right direction. This probe could reach our destination in about 17 years. And in another four years, when the signal from it reaches Earth, we'll know if there's an advanced civilization. Another possibility for faster than light travel is the warp bubble spacecraft. The spacecraft would have to compress space in front of it and stretch it behind its tail. Then we'll be able to reach any point in the universe in literally a few seconds but such travel remains a fantasy for us. Perhaps we can get to different corners of the universe through wormholes. They're shortcuts similar to tunnels, but there's one problem. These wormholes might be inside black holes. They're the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy that even light can't escape their trap. Our spaceships wouldn't stand the tension either. There's also a theory that Earth is unique because it was born under completely accidental circumstances. Four and a half billion years ago, our planet was a block of lava that began to cool and solidify, but its tranquility was broken by an asteroid the size of an entire planet flying by. The collision occurred at such an angle that the Earth was not completely destroyed, but part of the asteroid remained in our orbit. A heavy rock near our planet stabilized Earth's rotation, and the gravitational interaction with the giant debris caused our core to heat up. In addition, the asteroid brought a lot of water to Earth. Such a collision is extremely unlikely. It's like winning the lottery. 
many times in a row. But so far, we have no reason to believe life in outer space exists. Just as we have no reason to believe that there's no advanced civilizations in the universe, except for ours.